just want to give a quick overview of our agenda for today. So I'm going to quickly do a Google Education overview, going through what the different applications are, as well as some of our features. And I have Frank from Fall River Schools share his experience. At the very end, we're going to have a Q&A with, with Frank. So let's go to it. So we've, just, we, we've created Google Education to provide tools that we feel school and districts uh, would benefit from. We feel that the tools should be powerful, secure, and innovative. We'll go through each section. Powerful. Yeah. That more schools are definitely taking advantage of technology. And that's where Google Apps for Education fits in. We see that there are over 15 million users on Google Apps for Education. Um, we're actually slowly increasing the number. I think we're actually up to 16 million now. And you see a couple of different names. So there's you know, higher universities like Northwestern. There's also very large uh, K-12 districts like, like many area schools. Um, so just a partial list of all the schools um, that are on Google Apps for Education now. And when we speak about Google Apps for Education, I want to be very clear with what we're talking about. So we do provide you with a variety of tools for your school districts. It includes Gmail, Talk, Groups, Calendar, Thoughts, and Sites, all considered the core applications of Google Apps for Education. And we have the schools for free. Okay. We also provide a lot of the consumer applications. So the consumer tools that we provide in your control panel to schools. That might include your YouTube or your Casa or your blogger. Um, all things are accessible from your Google Apps for Education account name uh, through control panel. And the right price. So as I mentioned before, it is free. Uh, there's no credit card you need when you sign up. There's no billing information. All the tools we provide are free. And the other things that are included, we provide 24-hour, 7-day a week phone and email support. We provide a directory sync tool in case you have an active directory or somewhere uh, free system to provision your students. We provide creation tools in case you're moving from a legacy server, or you can migrate your data from previous systems to class for education. We provide a very in-depth online teacher training center. So the includes a lot of program development materials, also teacher academies and certifications. Um, so a robust network to not only get your, your students and your teachers on Google Apps, but also have them using it. A little bit about security. Now, we believe that when we buy these tools, we want to make sure that your information is secure. And there's a common question, you know, where is the best place for my data? Is it to store it in my company or school servers, or is it stored in the cloud? We believe the answer is to store your data in, in the cloud. Uh, the answer why security is so tough is because when you have so many devices um, and so many applications, it's really hard to keep all your data secure. So you see that 60% of you know, data resides in unprotected PCs, one out of 10 laptops will be slain, you know, two years of thumb drives are, are lost or stolen as well. And though there are all these data constraints, your end users still want to be able to access their data from anywhere, from any device. So provide that high functionality, as well as that depth of security, uh, that storing your data in the cloud is the best place. I often pose this question, you know, what does this picture look like? We often hear a variety of answers from uh, bin to a uh, very secure place. And this picture is a picture of one of our data centers. So you see that we take data security, data, physical data security very seriously. You see high fences, over real windows, no one can access this, this data center. And this, this is one of the many data centers where we store your data. We know that you feel your data is secure. And some other kind of common misconceptions. Um, so we can hear that Google owns your data when you move to Google Apps, and that's not true. Google does not own your data, you, you do. We all hear that, that you know, Google is mining all this data, and that's true either. So Google does not access your data unless you allow us to. We don't mine your data for ads since ads are disabled. We abide by U.S. privacy laws. So in our contract, we explicitly call out a FERPA compliance for Google Apps for Education. So we are compliant with the various 
U.S. US privacy laws regarding uh, protection for schools. We also, within the private, provide you with granular privacy controls. So not only do we have all these security, uh, both of physical security for your data as well as the privacy controls, we also provide you with granular privacy controls. You can see some here. So we provide you with inbound and outbound filters, so whitelist certain uh, addresses. There's also an inappropriate content filter. Uh, so if you have specific words as they're coming into your domain to be filtered out or to remove or to send to certain administrators, you can do that straight from the control panel. There's no additional cost. You also create a walled garden. So what a walled garden is, is you can allow certain users to just sell within your domain. So if you have younger students or elementary school student and you want them to use email but not be able to email outside of your domain, you can call guard student. You can all these functionalities provide to your school at no cost. And the last piece we think that's really important is innovative. You know, we want to focus on preparing our students for the future, whatever it may look like. And, you know, we think that in school is a very innovative company. You can see our timeline of Lots of different products and innovation at Google. Um, so just from Google.com, the search engine, to AdWords, Picasa, SketchUp, Binance, uh, there are lots of different products that Google has come up with. In addition, also, this is built into the product itself. So this is just kind of a sampling of the different features you can use. So when Google Docs, which is our presentation, document creation, spreadsheet creation, application, do collaborative lesson planning. With Google Forms and spreadsheets, you can create side projects and have data be directly input into a spreadsheet. Uh, you can do flashcards. You can do assessments. Uh, there are class lectures. So this is a screen from Gmail. And you can have direct video chat with different you know, world-class scientists, professors, directly from your classroom. Also use Google Sites for student e-portfolios. This is just a sampling of some of the innovative products we have that's part of core suite of tools. Some more tools in our marketplace. So you can see that there is this ecosystem for uh, lots of other partners to, to add on to the suite of tools. So in grade books, there are LMSs, and there's other tools that are all available in the marketplace ecosystem to help foster learning for your community. a really quick overview of Google Apps for Education. Uh, we do have Maps overview webinars every Tuesday and Thursday, and you can get more information on them for the Google Apps webinar page. I'm actually going to share It looks like we, you, you muted yourself for a second, but I just unmuted you. I believe you're sharing the presentation capabilities with Frank now, so Frank can talk a little bit about his experience at Fall River Schools. Perfect. Thank you, Evan. Um, I took a little slide to show of our background and history and, and how we did our cutter and how it's been going for us since. Um, so a little history, background. We we. At oh, email sorry, provider. Frank, we're, not, we're not seeing slides yet. Can you just make sure that you uh, that you're uh, sharing your screen? Sure. Um, meeting. If any folks have questions about glass, or if they have questions for Frank while he's talking, feel free to add them into that Q&A box. We're going to be uh, uh, answering them throughout the webinar as well as have some time for dedicated Q&A at the end. So, um, so you'll be able to find the, the share menu and be able to share your application of Chrome or of your slides, Frank. Okay, I don't see that. I have my slide queued up and Oh, 
<clears throat> there should be a menu within WebEx that says Share on your main WebEx page. And I see there are a couple questions that are coming in into the chat box. So uh, if you can ask those questions in the Q&A box. Oh, great. I see your, your desktop is coming up. Those okay. of you who are asking them in the chat box, if you can put them in that Q&A box, that way when we type the answer, everybody can see the answer. Uh, and we'll also be archiving those question and answers so that if we don't get to it in the webinar, you'll still be able to review it later on with the slides and the recorded webinar. So go ahead. It looks like that your slides are up now. Okay, great. So quick background. Um, I agree we have 10,000 students, 2,000 staff, um, 17 buildings. It switched email providers um, numerous times prior to switching to Google Apps. So our fear was, was um, us were constantly transitioning and constantly getting used to a new system. And, and so when we did the switch, we wanted to make sure that um, it would be a pretty permanent switch and it would be a, a fit for all you know everyone involved. So some things we we really took time to look at and investigate were we, we wanted to have the ability to scale. Our population seems to be growing each year, um, staff as well. We wanted to have them create and um, make sure the collaboration was always up and running and email was reliable. And um, we, we found that has been the case with, with Google since we've, been, uh, since we've done the cutover. The event we've we took some time to see, you know, kind of feel out what we what we wanted to manage ourselves and what we wanted to try to automate. Prior to switching, we researched third-party vendors um, to an idea of what was out there and what would make our lives easier going forward. So we got those vendors lined up. We got everything um, technology-wise ready for the switch. Gave ourselves some deadlines and uh, milestones. Told them. They switch over, uh, forward to the new temporary account by a certain date, familiarize themselves with uh, PD. We have a learning system called Moodle that we put all this information on, and, and they could go to the Google site as well. Um, we put our data over, confirmed that it moved, and uh, changed our DNS, and, and we, we were left with pretty much, uh, zero hiccups. Profession, again, we, we use our Moodle uh, learning management system. We have uh, um, kind of basic stuff that you'd see on Google Apps, but kind of uh, take it to our users. And frequent questions, I'll handle that all in, inside Moodle. As well, so we set up a PD calendar of events. Each week we did we tackled one topic, subject, that could um, do professional development time or the prep time come and attend to ease with the uh, the transition. Comment to we Google allows you to work with other vendors and their marketplace and these were two that we have chosen and that have been partners with us from the from this convention and been pretty happy with them. The Dot Factory, they're a company that allows us to have staff Give staff the ability to reset their passwords. It allows our Active Directory password to be the same as our Google Apps passwords. So work hand in hand. Ping Connect syncs Active Directory networking with Apps.net. Lets users reset, retrieve passwords, etc. So it, it took a lot of brain um, of our tech department. We kind of looked at what balls were coming in. And then 90 of them were with my password, I need it reset. So th those two vendors work actually with Google Apps to alleviate you know, that issue. And we we have two domains, forverschools.org and at forverschools.org, frpsstudent.org, I'm sorry, to archive our staff email. So we kept that separate. Students. In our state, we we don't need to. We did we did want to segregate two groups of our student population. One being um, K through five, our um, 
parents and school committee and school board didn't feel they should have the ability to email at that such a young age. And, and so we turn in features just for two five students. So if, if you look, you can see we just have, um, actually, this isn't a good screenshot. Mail is turned off. Calendar, docs, sites, groups, and contacts. As well as some third-party plugins, we have BrainPop that the students use, DreamBox, and a few others that once they authenticate into their Google Apps account, they can actually authenticate into those third-party vendors that we use. 6.12, we, same, same sort of features, we just add email. Um, and it's really neat because it allows us to, to keep it a, students to keep a digital portfolio. So fifth grade, they add to the sixth grade, they have all the documents that they've worked on. We just tell the ability for them to email. And we do that by domains. So frpsstudent.org, that's the lowest level. They don't have email set up on it. So anyone created into this subdomain as a we see mail accounts with a year of grad starting the um, username off. So for 19 Frank Farias, I would be a fifth year. I would not turn email on 18 Farias that following year. We would just add them to this group with email. We also have a group with which allows students to chat. Some of our special needs students require, we're requiring staff to go out to do home visits, and we could just set up a network in our, you know, you know, chat with them from my Some of the benefits that we've we've seen using Google Apps, switching over to Google Apps, it's available, it's reliable. You, you can always check the status of Google Apps online. So if something, you get a couple of calls and something quirky is going on, you can go right to this website and it'll say, 80% of the time, it's a small sub group of users that are affected, and it's maybe a five minute downtime, which probably in three years we've seen happen two to three times maximum. We, biggest vendors, I, I believe we had a, a, a maybe a gig to three gigs, and it, it was a constant I'm popping off, I'm hitting that ceiling. What do I keep? What do I get rid of? Uber had a, a user. I think maybe our most storage we're using is 5% and 6% of our gigs, and, and that's, um, that's pretty rare. Collaboration, um, students and staff are now using documents and computers um, to set up updates and, and sort of quizzes asked and they got real time, they're setting up groups, subgroups of different users that they, they can send a message to one address and 10 people get it. So it's, it's changed, it's really given us real time, um, change learning to, to be real time and, um, and pretty powerful. To collect and analyze data, Google Forms allows you to set up a, uh, almost a, uh, it's a spreadsheet analogy, but the front end of it looks like a form, so staff can set up a quiz, collect from students, and it automatically goes into a spreadsheet, and they can save and, and keep for grading purposes. We also have surveys to staff, um, general, just whatever we, info we want to collect from them. They can We can embed to the website, send it as an email, pretty cool um, feature. Based on the third-party marketplace solutions with Ping Connect and um, the factory, there's, there's thousands of different solutions that, depending on the district would have set up, that they would go with uh, Google Apps implementation if, if needed. Doctorship, this is something that we just started to touch base on or uh, look to, to using more. It, it allows you, we have some turnover, so if, it, so if our CFO decides to, um, he's here for a year, he's generated all these documents, he's accumulated all this work, 
he leaves and the new CFO comes in, it, it takes a month or two to, to get documents he's worked on and kind of catch up to where he left. You, Google allows you to put two different email addresses in and ownership of documents. So, for instance, our Taiwan one director was here for six months, kind of spent four months collecting documents from our Title One director. Now, Title One director, after she left us six months, we just transferred documents. So, day one, she had everything um, she needed. So, it, it's it saves time and um, keeps keeps things consistent and everyone, you know, up running. Videos, the K through 12 students, K through 5, they can keep the documents, they can keep the drawings, they keep the spreadsheets. Turn on at, in grade through 12. We allow students two years after graduation to keep their emails active. So if they're going out looking for employment, they can use a portfolio or a resume for employers, which has really um, feedback has been really positive on. Looks like I skipped the slide. And uh, but not least, we we. Google Apps completely changed the way that we communicate. It's um, I don't know what those districts are, but we it seemed like we were having meetings for meetings for meetings, and then uh, more meetings. So you have real time chat, voice, video. You can share a document. Ten people can collaborate and chat and share on that same document. So a lot of work can be laid for. A meeting. So going in, it, it's just it kind of just tying up loose ends, and, and um, you get to to business. So that that's been a, a wonderful um, bonus to, for having Google Apps available to us, and given the ability to communicate real time, students and staff now now um, is that they're instant. They can um, take them in the lab. You can give them a certain time to, to take them. And our, uh, our own regret is that we didn't we didn't swim in our um, staff have completely embraced Google Apps and um, uh, to all the new each month or so a different plugin or a different marketplace app or a plan book that ties into Google Apps um, that they're they're really now eager to learn and familiarize themselves with it. So it, it's been a, a wonderful and a positive experience uh, across the board. Just wanted to leave my contact info. Anyone? If, uh, I don't. If we don't get to all the questions, or if anyone has any questions that I'd like to email me specifically, feel free to drop my contact info down, and I'll be more than glad to. Thank you so much, Frank. And Stephen, there's been a bunch of uh, questions that have come through the Q&A box, and I was thinking that maybe you could go through some of those and answer them, and the ones that are for Frank, you could uh, pose them to him as well. Sounds good. So let's start off with some of the questions for Frank. Um, Frank, we, we got a question from Ryan Cox, and he was wondering why you had two, two different domains were created versus simply creating various user groups in apps and then selecting which groups has access to various tools. Okay, so the, the first reason we have to have our staff email years regulation in Massachusetts. We have to do that to, for students. So with Postini, we've in, we've included Postini archiving on our staff domain, and there's there's a, there's a cost to that that we didn't want to incur. For our 10,000 students, if, if we didn't need to, so that that, that was the the major reason for the segregation of the domains, and the, the pit with the student domain was done because our school board did not end any students K through five using email. Great, thanks for that answer. And we have another question from Prick Holmes. And asked, did you create your own Moodle classes, or did you find them somewhere? Also, would you be willing to share your Moodle classes via export? Uh, we, we did create our Moodle classes. We, we, um, 
a lot of the information on the Google EDU startup site, deployment site, I, I think it gives you a timeline as to what you should deploy in, in recommended PD. So we kind of a lot of that information and uh, tailored it to our staff, but I, we would absolutely be uh, willing to like, export it and share, share it with anyone, and uh, they could upload it to their Moodle instance. That's great. Much for that. And then Kathy Kensky asked, how do you document that they don't have email addresses for your K-5 students? I do use documents without email addresses. Yes. It, um, they saw th this too. Can you still see my screen, Stephen? Yep. There's two different logins. Um, so, done. What do, what subdomain a, a student is in? This. I don't know if you can see that address, docs.google.com slash a slash FRPS student. Yep. For our K-5 through sites, if you look, um, let's go to Doran. If you look at their Google Apps login, I apologize, we're a little slow today. We just link address to the K through five school. So when a student goes to log in they get into a, a, a documents portal and they can only see documents and our students who have email look into this address, mail dot <coughs> Google dot com. And if they if they've been given the permission inside the Google um, the admin interface, they're allowed to authenticate. So it sounds complicated, but it actually is. It's actually not. It, it um. This Google interface, you can. I blurred the students' names out, but if you just select whatever student you want to have email, and then right-click and move them to this domain, they can log in and see email. If you don't do that, when they log in, they only see documents. Got it. Thanks for answer. Uh, I'm going to take some questions right now as well. Uh, so the question was, um, and case, uh, can you show us what single sign-on looks like for Google Apps for Education? Uh, single sign-on would, would look like kind of any other single sign-on setup you might have through a port. Uh, there are some really useful tools out there. One that I'd highly recommend checking out is called SSO Easy. So SSOE.com. They are really great. Single sign integration. Uh, and Cohen asks, is Google Apps available for free to private schools? Uh, Once said four private schools are charging for using it. So Google Apps for Education is free for non-profit private schools. It is not free for for-profit schools. Let me see the questions we might have here. Uh, there was a question regarding Google Plus. So right now, Google Plus is available for higher education. However, it is not available for K-12 schools yet. Uh, that is something that our team is looking into and working on. But I do not have any definite timelines for when Google Plus will be available. We, we've had some questions about that, Stephen, um, if, if we could allow that for students. But I think if you read the terms of service, it's, it's 18 plus, so most of our students um, the end license wouldn't, wouldn't allow them to, to use it at this point. Yep. So uh, th another question for you, Frank. Can you leave up your contact information while we're kind of doing Q&A? I think there are some people who want to see your contact information. Uh, another question for you, Frank. Are you doing any type of mail archiving? We are, and we, we use Postini for, for that. Our, our staff email needs to be archived for seven years, and, and we use Postini to, uh, to accomplish, accomplish that for us. Okay. Okay. And for everybody on the line, Postini does have a cost. Um, there, Right now, the cost is $4.33 per, per year for one of archiving meeting, $7 per user per year, per year for up to 10 years of archiving. So Postini is not considered a core service. There is a cost for the email archiving service. The, the, the Postini message security, I, I believe, is 
free. We we use that for um, in, um, message filtering. We we use that for students, and I believe that's free. Yeah, a lot of the message filtering uh, services are now included in the App for Education, uh, the core suite from the control panel. Question for you, Frank. Uh, so uh, we understand you created accounts for students under 13. Uh, how do you go about uh, either uh, parental consent or you know, how did, uh, include SLA? How did you get approval to create those accounts? Originally, we well, we put we set up the domain mid-year, so we just we sent out um, people we use modified our acceptable use and asked parents to sign and um, return the slips. At the start of this school year, we we send out we just added it to our packets with the rest of the information we collect from parents, and um, I we thought more parents would would send their students documents, but I, I think out of 10,000 students, we've had 10 not, um, you know, not allow their students to participate. Got a question for you, Frank. So kind of out of the, all the applications you have turned on, whether that be Gmail, Docs, Sites, uh, which application are you using the most and why? I would say staff are using Gmail. Most just Obviously, they send messages back and forth. Students are using Gmail, but I would I would say documents are what they what they're, pri they're primarily using. Sharing and um, collaborating on documents and um, stuff. So I'd say docs for students and email for staff. Okay, and we also understand that you're using some of the third party tools. Uh, I I believe you're using. Kennedy and the .NET Factory. Yeah, .NET Factory. Can you tell us a little bit about those as well as the cost associated with them? I believe I, I'm, I'm not sure offhand. I, I want to say I want to say five. I want to say five thousand per per domain for pay identity. And the and .NET Factory was a three year. It's a three year cost, and then and then you own the software, and you can. You can buy um, certain packages, but um, they split the cost of the software into three years, and then after that, you can choose to um, have their support, or you can, you can just pay as if issue arises, they, they charge you hourly. Um, the amount of time that it saves us in, in account management, account creation, and passwords um, synchronization, it's it's all it's with it's been well worth the cost. Uh, let me take some questions again. So Julia Drake asked what granular controls. So from your control you do have granular controls in terms of creating your users, uh, assigning them different uh questions you want them to use. You can whitelist certain things. There there's just a lot of different settings from your control panel over in administrating of your domain. Joe Bryan asks, do teachers and staff share the same Google Apps for Apps account into different groups? Uh, so once again, you can choose how you want to administer your domain. You can choose if you want to have a separate subdomain for your teachers. You can also keep everybody in the same domain. Um, options are available to you. Another question from Kelly Fahey. She asks, I understand that there are more than one webinar being offered this week the main differences between the different webinars on the different dates. We do have different webinars. We have one today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. And each webinar is going to feature a different school, so they gave a different experience um, for their Google Ops for Education deployment. Do you see that most of your staff are using the webmail client or another client? Do they use a local client? Uh, what I see in your experience. Me like Outlook or, or another third third party. Yeah, do you using Outlook or third party, or do you see them mostly using the webmail client? I, I think the webmail client. We, we've kind of where they can't really use Outlook, but we've we've discouraged them from using Outlook because 
it kind of it kind of only it really only allows you to look at one huge outlook. You can check your email, kind of you can sync your calendars, but you, I feel that you get the, the full experience. So we've kind of really encouraged them to just use the, the web interface because then you have all your tools accessible: your documents, your chat, your um, calendar, your groups. It's less restrictive than just in and then, um, we we weren't huge fans of Outlook. It, it's um, it, it's been nice to get you log in and you're into your email Outlook. You start to accumulate so many messages and so many gigabytes of data that it would take you know five to ten minutes to start up and uh, we don't miss those days. Got it. Can you also tell us a little bit more about possible professional development uh, services? So, so did you run trainings? Did you have a certified teacher come in? Uh, how did you get your users accustomed to using Google for education? Um, we we have some we had some we have instruct technology staff that kind of go out. I kind of put together our basic core trainings that, and, and then our instructional technology staff went out to school and kind of, you know, staff didn't yeah, a second I can kind of show what I got online and then they went out to each school to show them kind of was available, available to them online or some of our staff who didn't really hesitated to go online to learn this stuff would, would go to these in person speed development days and get their information that way. But going forward we encouraged them to this was our one kind of our one stop shopping. Um, any questions they had, how do you chat and Gmail, search for message message basics. Um, we we found that doing so many switches we found that doing so many switches in such a short time Created so much anxiety. People um, they get accustomed to the look. They get accustomed to the interface. They get accustomed to navigation. That, that if you if you kind of have information available to them, telling them what's going to change and how it's going to look, it, it reduces that. So we tried to put as much as we could online, um, give a heads up and show them showing them how to do things. That we feel it helped with the. Um, and it's still um, they they still use it as a resource. Okay. Right. Um, so the question uh, for for Google uh, is there a way to view student docs without having them share the doc with you? So natively within the application, there's no way to just view a student's document. There is a third party tool uh, called CloudLock, and what's going to I'll write in the, the Q and A. Uh, Cloud L O C K. So Cloud Lock uh, allows you to view your students' documents as well as um, see what other their sharing settings are. So Cloud Lock is a really powerful tool if you are looking for the natural granular uh, security feature. We do, Stephen. Is we we just reset their their passwords and, and go in and, and the, the acceptable use. We kind of we kind of made it so that. Students knew they truly own their information. Like if we, if needed, we 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 could go in to check out um, if we suspected that something inappropriate was happening. So we just yeah, that's definitely another way you can go about it. So uh, as an administrator, you always always have access to all of your students. So you always change their password and log into your account um, if you suspect something. There's also another tool that we offer for free called the uh, audit email audit API and the email audit API helps you to take a snapshot of your user's inbox without having to log into their account. So that's available um, through our APIs. A uh, question for you, Frank. So the market tools that you're using, uh, have you seen that basically they're all PC and Mac compatible? And also, did you use any vendors to help you with any integrations or data migrations or, or, or anything like that? Yes, we use the Fenway Group. I, I believe they've changed their name. Um, I, I, I could I could get that for you, but they they were pretty reasonable, and we came back. We really didn't need to. It, it was pretty straight. If you follow the the deployment guidelines, it's pretty straightforward. Um, 
it, we split in the summer, and, it, and it, all of our, a lot of our tech staff was gone, and as well as most of our staff. So it was kind of I, I had a little anxiety myself doing the switch. So it was nice to have someone that if something didn't propagate or our what our X records were, or if, if the hiccup, we could call someone who does it every day. So it was basically just a uh, safety net, but it, it was. It wasn't necessary, but the, the Fenway Group, I believe, it, it's called it. I, I get the um, their new name. They, they were reasonable, and, and it was worth having them uh, as you know a resource. Okay, that sounds great. Real quick, Stephen, I, I, going talking about new features that uh, are added. We we've noticed that in mo and this is the Google Apps. Uh, admin interface, and in um, recently we've noticed that the ability. These are all staff devices, um, iPhones, iPads, Android phones, and we were coming up, coming across uh, is where staff would lose their phone or leave. Um, I'm not sure if I can display this information, so I'll go back to uh, a different screen, but. They would lose their phone or lose their notebook or the notebooks would get stolen and stolen and there'd be a panic. There was all this data and all this information on their phones. So right through the interface on, a, on an iPhone, an Android, or an iPad, we wipe those devices out remotely. And so this is this a, a huge, what was a huge security issue uh, previously, maybe a month or so ago, Google released that and, it, and it's been, uh, we had to do it, but going forward if we ever lose a device or have a device stolen, we get the, that all the emails and all the documents on that device wiped out. So that that's that's a pretty powerful tool as well. All right. Um, another thing I would kind of focus on or repeat kind of on the webinar is we do have a ton of resources online for schools who are looking to go Google. They're actually a guide to going Google. So if you Google Guide to Going Google. The first tab has a technical plan, and if you click on the technical plan, there's a K-12 deployment guide, and the K-12 deployment guide will walk you step step through all the different things you need to do for successful deployment. It's a pretty new guide, but this guide is basically your one-stop shop for everything you need. And we'll be sure to send it out, the guide to going on Google. Frank, question for you. Do you mind emailing your presentation out to the attendees? Not a problem. Okay. So you can just provide your slides to me, and I will make sure that it goes out with uh, Stephen's slides and the recording of the webinar. Okay, sure. We question regarding Google Plus. So can we allow our staff to use Google Plus on our main? Um, so unfortunately, the answer is no. Google, Google Plus is not... Um, allowed for any K-12 domains. Uh, simply there, there, right now, there's no way for us to restrict it to just users for 13. So because of that, the decision was to made uh, to, right now, Turtle Plus for all K-12 domains. Frank, do you, have, uh, do you allow your teachers to manage or administrate a uh, class setup, or do you have designated sites uh, administrators. I'm only administrator. Do you want your users to create a group? We do. That allows your 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 teacher to create groups themselves, or do you create groups for them, or, or what's kind of the setup there? We allow them to create their own groups. Okay. So you may have algebra one, high school algebra one, and they they have student email addresses to, um, uh, in essence, it, it's a it's a serve uh, you know, sort of group that uh, they send to that Algebra One high school, and it, and, it, and it goes to the students that they add. Let's see if there are any other questions that I can answer. I thought I would also point out that after this webinar, I'll be hosting a Google Hang on air. So if there's anyone who has Google Plus and would like to ask a question in person or on air, um, feel free to join my Google Plus on air, and I'll send the link um, 
that's kind of Q and A time is over. Frank, what would you say are some of the major challenges you had to overcome? Challenges, obstacles, things you didn't necessarily think about when you first started the deployment. I, I, I really, it, it went pretty pretty smoothly. We we spent some time preparing. Um, some some of the migration after the fact, we gave staff a day, um, a, a certain date to say verify that your messages have migrated over and, and that you're happy with um, the migration. And maybe a month after the migration, they would say, well, I'm missing this or I'm missing that, which we weren't really sure. It kind of created um, an issue, but we weren't sure if they really were missing or if they really did have them. But that, that was really the only kind of up that we, we saw staff um, maybe a handful or so complaining they, that their their data didn't migrate over. Um, we 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 made sure that we didn't. It can be overwhelming the the suite of components that come with Google Apps to you know do this conversion from a, a pretty generic email system to Google Apps and then say hey you have calendars you have docs you have sites you have this. So we we focused and kind of focused in Gmail as our target system for the lease, so we did tons of PD and um, done talking about the interface to them and how folders and now there's, now there's um, things get tagged, so we just focused on Gmail and it kind of it kind of helped out with the transition and then gradually they, they found documents and, and we're excited about it, and then turn you know, the training and the PD. But I, I there, there were major, there weren't major issues to mention. It was um, I just plan, take some time to plan and your kind of attack on. I, I would say email and calendar maybe to start, and then plan documents, groups, stuff like that, and and. The staff will kind of guide you in the direction that they just that they're looking for, so you can kind of each development start to tweak it towards what they're looking for. But it, it went pretty smoothly. Great. Uh, another question for you: um, How are you doing password resets? Did you get a lot of password resets? Do you have an automated process, or do they help take it? How, how do you do password resets for your students and teachers? Yeah, well, both. We we do have we did have a lot and um, that's why we research the third party vendor the .dot net and the ping identity vendors because um, we have to remove ourselves from from that whole process and how how it really works is connect looks at active Active Directory server so we get a user in Active Directory f various within ten seconds a user shows up in the Google app admin domain, so it automatically creates a user account for them. And the opposite happens if you delete or you disable an account in Active Directory, it disables them in Google Apps. So Ping Connect kind of tied that account creation and management in. And then .NET allows users to reset their Active Directory passwords. Without using Active Directory, it's like a web-based interface, and it allows them to set up if you were banking, street you grew up on, favorite dog, where you were married, you know, generic questions like that that allow you to reset your password. So Ping Connect, tying the password in from Active Directory to Google Apps, .NET, allowing them to reset it, it, it totally removed us from from that process. Um, and as long as they enroll in, in the, within the system, they have the ability to you know, via the web interface to reset the password or retrieve the password at any time. It, it, it works pretty seamlessly. Got, got it. Um, another question for you. So do you allow your students or student, students or teachers to Google Sites? Do you have Google Sites for different classrooms or are you using Google Sites at all? We use Google Sites for our student domain. We would use it for our staff, but we, we use a, a content management system um, that we were using prior to using Google Apps. So we, we didn't want there to be confusion between uh, parent, public, 
looking for information? Is it on a Google site? Is it on the website? So we, we've staff, we've disabled sites on our staff domain, um, and that, that's another reason we kind of segregated the the two because there, there were every district I'm sure has a unique um, need for both groups. And our, ours was we, we wanted them to continue to use our content management system to post information, homework, office hours, etc. And um, students we allowed to use it for web development classes, and they could they could just set up um, a page just just to just for fun if if they wish. But um, our staff we we continue to ask them to use our our own um, in-house content management system. That sounds good. Um, I think there are some kind of leftover questions that I will be answering over Q&A, just text, so I will write back all the questions. Uh, if there are any further questions, feel free to contact Fred directly at his email over there uh, on the screen. And as I mentioned before, I will be hosting a Google Plus uh, out on air, and I will send that through the announcements for WebEx. Anything you might want to add, Dana? So I just want to give everybody a reminder that we did record this webinar, so we will be sending out a link to the slides as well as this recording um, later this week. So you can review any of the content if any of the, of the, the audio dropped off and be able to come back to that. And we will also send out a link to the Q&A archive. So if you ask a question in the, in the Q&A box and we didn't get to it, we're going to go through and answer those and send out that transcript so you'll be able to see, um, see any of the, the questions and answers that we didn't actually see during the webinar. So again, thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks everybody.